in, in, at, the, at the entrance of this building. And in the e uh, afternoon, uh, we have one, two, three, four, seven. five, six, seven. We have uh, seven presentations uh, in the field of tropical cyclone and the Mediterranean oscillation <coughs> as, and so forth. And before starting the lecture, uh, maybe you slept last night very well, and uh, in the bed you may review uh, the yesterday's lecture, and you came up with some questions. And if you have some questions related to yesterday's uh, lecture, please raise your hand, and uh, it's now time for questions. I heard yokoi san you has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question about the uh, ice structure uh, and uh, in free troposphere. Uh, free troposphere, you said there is a substance. It is mainly due to the radiative cooling in, in the steady state. In the steady state. But uh, yeah, I I am a little puzzled because you know yeah. I understand that there is a uh, radio cooling there, but uh, the warm core is still warmer than surrounding uh, eye wall. Oh, so, yes. so in, in, in this case, the radio cooling is not so powerful if you cause the subsidence, I imagine. But, uh, so, what, how can you understand? So, there, when the eye is spinning up, okay. there is very strong subsidence, yeah. and it makes it very hot. When it reaches a steady state, you come into a state where the temperature, of course, is not changing, and so there's a balance. Mm -hmm. And the primary balance is between, there is radiative cooling because the temperature is much higher than radiated equal of the temperature. So it is cooling. And so you have a balance between substance and cooling. So, yeah, so there's no convection in the eye. <coughs> Outside the eye, it's primarily a balance between convection and vertical motion. Maybe it's something you can cool it. But in the eye, it's clear, usually overhead, so there's yes. um, uh, enough water vapor in the air that there's a you know, fair bit of infrared emissions to space, so it is cooling. But not very fast. Oh. So it's a very gentle substance. So it's comparable to the actual substance. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like a uh, Cloud free uh, with uh, some, some high areas. Exactly. Except that, as you point out, it's hotter. But so, otherwise. Can still. I ask the yeah. question to you? So, uh, uh, thank you. So, how long the time scale is in that case? Radiative cooling should have a very long time scale. I guess. Well, it does. And um, uh, the uh, if, you, if you disturb things away from radiative equilibrium, it's a very long. Time scale, right. we go back to that. Uh, and it's much longer than the time scale of the evolution of the storm. So the steady state is very idealized. Okay. Typically, tropical cyclones are changing their intensity all the time. And that really will dominate the vertical motion. In fact, if the tropical cyclone is weakening rapidly, just from thermal wind balance, the temperature in the core has to fall. And it does so by air rising, not by radiation. So, uh, in my image, the, yeah. like the time scale is about uh, you know one week or yes. more than long longer than that time That's scale. right. Mm -hmm. It is about in, in an idealized field, right? Absolutely. So it's only in the idealized case of a perfectly steady cyclone that mm -hmm. the radiation is an important part of the budget. Now, I am not talking about the genesis of tropical cyclones in this series of talks at this is in time, but many of us are beginning to think that in the early stages of genesis, the radiation is very important there too, but it is more the infrared trapping by high clouds in, in a cluster, the self-aggregation physics that go with that that's important. Thank you. I understand that it is steady state, uh, very idealistic. Very idealistic. Okay. Yeah. So any other questions related to yesterday's lecture? Okay, if not, uh, let's get started with today's lecture. Yeah, please. Uh, Thank you.
First of all, good morning. It's very uh, nice to see so many wide awake, uh, happy faces this morning. <laughs> well, at least there's one or two. Um, but anyway, it was, we all had a very enjoyable evening last night. And thank you all for, for that. Have a very nice time there. Um, this morning, I want to do uh, uh, two things, basically, is to um, talk about uh, confining myself to the theme of axisymmetric physics. Um, rem remember always that real tropical cyclones are seldom exactly axisymmetric, but in the spirit of learning something simple, before you learn something complicated, we're going to stick to the simple uh, axisymmetric framework. It's already complicated enough, uh, in my view, uh, that one should spend some time trying to understand that before going into much more complex real world kind of situation. So my object is to try to obtain a satisfactory understanding of the physics. And my object is not to build a better weather forecast model, but I think it helps if you want to build a better weather forecast model to first understand the physics. So I'm going to try to do that. So this morning I'm going to talk about the time dependence, that is the intensification of tropical cyclones. And I'm going to start with some assumptions here, the same that we used yesterday, that the flow is axisymmetric, circularly symmetric. Um, I'm going to assume that above the boundary layer, uh, even though it's evolving in time, um, the uh, gradient and hydrostatic balance are maintained. So this is parallel to the theory of quasi-geostrophy, where you assume the first order balance is geostrophic. Here we're assuming the first order balance is gradient wind balance. And um, as with the steady state theory, I'm going to continue to assume that convection, moist convection, is fast compared to the evolution of the vortex. The convection tends to adjust the atmosphere on time scales of an hour or two, something like that. The tropical cyclone can intensify rapidly, but even if it's intensifying very rapidly, it's more like a time scale of 10 to 20 hours. So it's a longer, maybe by one order of magnitude, longer time scale. So I will, I will as with the theory of quasi-geostrophic motions, uh, assume that the vortex is evolving through a sequence of states that are convectively neutral. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that. But, um, um, so we're going to just try to look, come up with the simplest possible understanding of how storms intensify. Now, I guess I remembered what I wanted to say. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to assume that we've already had genesis. Now, this statement I just made brings up the question, what do I mean by that? In this particular case, I mean something very specific. It's not necessarily good for other definitions of genesis, but I'm going to assume that the core of the tropical cyclone is already saturated with water. The humidity is 100% all the way through the troposphere in the innermost region of the tropical cyclone. And that's certainly not true during the early formative stages of a tropical cyclone. So I'm kind of assuming that we've already got to that state, all right? And now we're going to ask, what governs the intensification of the storm? Uh, what's the, what governs the time scale? Why is it 15 hours? 10 or 15 hours and not 100 hours or not one hour, what's governing that time scale? Okay, and um, uh, so what we're going to do is use a lot of the material that I presented yesterday, so I will only review it today. Um, we're going to start with this elementary equation I derived yesterday for thermal, thermal wind balance in a convectively neutral cyclone. So if you remember this, this is the angular momentum. Um, and uh, we got this by integrating up along an angular momentum surface. So that surface has a value m. This is the radius that that surface has at the top of the boundary layer. This is the radius it has at the place where the angular momentum surface crosses um, the uh, place where v equals 0 in the upper troposphere. Uh, this is the temperature at which that happens, we call that the outflow temperature, and then this is the temperature at the top of the boundary layer. And this is the gradient of saturation moist entropy, which is our temperature variable. 
um, with respect to angular momentum. So this is like we derived yesterday. And if we define the outflow temperature um, as the plate, uh, the temperature at the place where this m surface crosses v equals zero, then at that point m can be expressed as one half times f times r naught squared. So I'm going to substitute that in here, and the result is that writing this kind of upside down, we're going to take the result of that, but turn it upside down <coughs> algebraically. Uh, you can think of this as an equation for the radius of the surface. So the radius squared is, is angular momentum divided by this coefficient. The one half f comes from one half f r naught squared divided by r naught squared. So that's going to be one important sort of our balance relationship I'm actually going to use here. Okay? It's just kind of turned upside down algebraically. Then um, there's the Richardson number criticality equation that we derived yesterday. It's basically the upper boundary condition. It's for the gradient of outflow temperature with respect to angular momentum. And we have this critical Richardson number. Um, this is really uh, the same as R, what I've been calling R naught squared. And um, this is uh, dm by ds star. So that's the same that we derived yesterday. And then we have uh, an equation for the uh, conservation of entropy. Now, if we, this is very important, I'm going to write this equation in a coordinate system in which angular momentum is the independent radial variable. Okay? As I um, advocated yesterday, the equations are much simpler in that coordinate than they are in physical coordinates. So remember, angular momentum is being treated as an independent variable. If you take the total time derivative and expand it in this coordinate, you get a partial derivative, and I've used tau instead of time as a shorthand, because this means that when I take the partial derivative, I'm holding pressure and angular momentum constant, and not pressure and radius. Okay. This is the time rate of change, the total time rate of change of angular momentum times the gradient of entropy with respect to angular momentum. This is uh, g times the uh, divergence of the, actually it's convergence of the turbulent flux of entropy. Um, and this is uppercase p to denote once again that when we take this derivative, the two other variables we're holding constant are angular momentum and time. That's why I use uppercase p. It's kind of a shorthand so that you remember what else we're holding constant. And then this is the dissipative heating. Okay. So um, we can in turn write that the angular, the time rate of change of angular momentum is just gravity times the radius times the vertical derivative of the tangential stress. That's tau in the theta direction. So what we're going to do is substitute this back. I'm going to go backwards into this equation. And then I'm going to integrate this over the depth of the boundary layer, the pressure depth of the boundary layer. So assuming that the entropy does not vary with height within the boundary layer, which is a pretty good assumption, um, if I integrate the time derivative, I just get the time derivative times the pressure depth of the boundary layer. That's delta p. Then by integrating this term, I get um, g r times the surface stress times this guy. Now, in integrating uh, this in the vertical, I have assumed that there's no um, <coughs> torque, or uh, I should say there's no turbulent flux of angular momentum through the top of the boundary layer. That turns out to be a pretty good approximation in the core of the storm, but it's not such a good approximation well outside of the core. And then, um, let me just go backwards a minute. When I integrate this with height, I get the g times the surface entropy flux. And once again, I've assumed that there's no turbulent flux of entropy through the top of the boundary layer. And that's also pretty reasonable in the core, but not outside the core. Okay, so we have, and this is just the depth average dissipated heating in the boundary layer divided by temperature. 
So the surface flux of entropy is really just the surface enthalpy <coughs> flux divided by temperature. This is what we used yesterday. It's the classic aerodynamic formula. Um, I'll say again, in the real world, we don't actually know what CK is in the core of a well-developed tropical cyclone because the surface physics change completely. It's a very interesting area of research on tropical cyclones, which I don't have time to go into today. I had a nice conversation over dinner with one of you last night about research on sea spray and how it affects this. And so I'm going to approximate this whole thing in the spirit of simplicity of this coefficient density, velocity, and then this is just the difference between the entropy of the sea surface and the entropy of the boundary layer. So I'm basically taking this enthalpy difference divided by temperature to be equal to this entropy difference. That would be a good approximation if the entropy difference is small. Okay. Uh, it's just a shorthand. I don't have to do that. It just makes it a little bit easier notationally. The surface torque is just the drag coefficient times the wind speed at the surface times the azimuthal velocity. And then the dissipated heating, once again, is going to go as the cube of the surface wind speed. Then we use all of those in this equation. And the result is this. Okay? So this is the depth integrated entropy equation. I've defined H as the pressure depth divided by density times gravity. It has the units of altitude, maybe a couple of kilometers or so in reality. Then this is the m dot, it's the source or sink of angular momentum. This is the gradient of entropy with respect to angular momentum. This is the surface entropy flux. This is what's driving the whole tropical cyclone, is this guy. And then we have this term that's proportional to the cube of the wind speed. At low wind speeds, this is dominant. But when it gets up to mature state, this second term is of the same order of magnitude as the first term. So all it's important to include the dissipated heating uh, quantitatively. So the last thing I want to say about this system, and then I'll summarize it, is that we have to deal with the eye. And I'm going to explain why we have to deal with the eye a little bit later. The eye is a very special place. It's not deep convective. It's not saturated with water. And what we're going to do for this very simple model is to nevertheless assume that it's still in thermal wind balance. That's probably a pretty good assumption. It's going to be in gradient balance and hydrostatic balance. But it's not going to be neutral to slantwise convection, probably. And we're simply going to assume that inside the radius of maximum winds, wherever that occurs, that, the, that there's going to be a particular profile of this uh, azimuthal wind with radius. That is, I'm going to let the gradient wind in the eye just be um, the maximum wind speed in the storm times the radius divided by the radius of maximum winds to some power n, which I can specify as a parameter, but specifying that n is at least equal to 1, so that the profile is concave. Now, what this accomplishes is basically to, um, by the simple assumption, all right, is to encompass all of the complex mixing by eddies across the eye wall into the eye. Um, I'm basically uh, coming up with a very simple representation of what those eddies accomplish, which is to drive the eye uh, circulation into something close to solid body rotation. And then, once we've assumed that, we're going to basically take this equation and solve it for the distribution of entropy with respect to angular momentum in the eye. So we're going to use thermal wind balance to determine what the temperature of the eye is, that's all. We've already specified the wind speed. So if I plug this into here and solve for this, uh, I get a very simple, these are both constants. So the right-hand side of this equation is constant, and that just says S star is a linear uh, function of m. It's decreasing with m in the eye. Uh, by the way, I made a mistake here. I have to correct it. When I went through the slides this morning, I said, I don't want this to be necessarily 1, so I let it be n, but then I didn't change it here. <laughs> so this is, this is with n equals 1, all right? That's what happens when you drink too much sake the night before. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so this, this is for the special case n equals 1, but you can see that it would be easy to integrate this for any arbitrary value of n. I just didn't get around, I didn't do it. Um, now, so we are going to continue to solve this entropy, boundary layer entropy equation even in the I, but it will turn out that the entropy in the boundary layer in the I is always going to be less than the saturation entropy. <laughs> which means the eye will turn out always to be convectively stable. There's no deep convection in the eye. All right, so let me summarize this. Um, it's actually, uh, may look a little complicated, it's actually a simple system to solve, all right, for you applied mathematicians. You can't solve it analytically, but I'm gonna show you, based on just some analytic manipulations of these, it shows you some very interesting features of it, and then we're gonna solve it numerically. There is only one time-dependent equation in this whole model, and it's the equation for the entropy of the boundary layer. And I want to emphasize that in this conception, the time scale of the evolution of the vortex is controlled by the physics of the boundary layer. It's not, it's not a convective time scale. Convection is still fast compared to this. So once again, we have advection in angular momentum coordinates. This is the advection of entropy. This is the driver, it's the surface flux of entropy. And then we have some dissipative heating. This is the thermal wind balance, although it may not look like that to you, that's what it is, okay. Uh, this is the upper boundary condition that we talked about yesterday that we're gonna use. And then this is just the definition of angular momentum turned backwards, okay, so that once we have angular momentum, we can derive V, all right. Um, a few other things uh, that uh, we need to specify that when we integrate this equation like we did yesterday, we're going to assume that the radius of maximum winds this outflow temperature is the tropopause temperature. I don't, I'm not very comfortable with that assumption. Um, we're going to assume that the boundary layer entropy is equal to the saturation entropy above the boundary layer, that's convective neutrality, except in the I, so in the I, we have to, there's one other equation besides the ones on this list. In the I, we're going to use this. So as we integrate this model at every time step, we figure out where the radius and maximum winds is. Inward of that, we solve this very simple equation for the S star of the I. Remember, we're solving this whole thing in angular momentum space. And if we want to, at the end, if we want to look at a pretty graph of the storm in R versus in the standard physical coordinates, we can transform this back into physical coordinates, but it's much easier to solve it in angular momentum coordinates. Now, if you want to run this model, it will run on your laptop, even if it's an old one, in, in about two seconds, okay? It's very fast, the numerical solution. And so I'm going to leave this up. You could do this now if you want to, if you have MATLAB on your laptop, it's, it's very, very simple to do that. So if you go to this website, uh, you can download this model and uh, run it, okay, yourself and see how it performs. Yeah. Uh, in that uh, last stage, yeah. the previous stage, uh, this is complete system. Uh, so uh, yes. there, there are four equations. Yes. There are four uh, dependent variables. Right. Could you summarize them? Which are the so we have the entropy of the boundary layer. We're going to specify the depth of the boundary layer. That's a good question. Uh, we have the velocities. Now, I haven't said this yet, but I'm going to equate the azimuthal wind to the total wind. This is essentially a gradient azimuthal wind. This is the total wind at the surface. And yesterday, we showed that they're very close to each other. So these aren't separate variables. They're the same ones. Um, this is going to be specified, although, um, as, the, as the pressure drops, S star goes on. So if I want to include pressure dependence, I have to put, write down the gradient balance equation for pressure. So that you might consider you need that equation too if you're going to want to let this be pressure dependent. I'm going to specify these exchange coefficients. They're not calculated. They're just, we don't know what they are, but I will specify them. Okay? You can, in the model, you can set them to what you want them to be. Um, S star and SB are the same, except in the I. 
And we'll come back to the I in a minute. So for now, consider this to be SV. We are going to specify a critical Richardson number and specify this radius. So we have T naught, which also appears here. Okay, So that's another variable. This is an equation for that. And then this just relates V and M. So we have S, we have V, we have R, okay, and we have T naught, and we have four equations for that. But in the I, we have to do something different, and that's going back to, sorry, back to this equation. Inside the radius of maximums, we have a different equation. But yeah, it's a, it's a closed system. <clears throat> Now, so uh, I'm going to leave that up there. If you want to copy that down, um, you can download that and run it. So the model itself, I think, has is 12 kilobytes file. Uh, so that should download pretty quickly. I have a little PDF file which describes it, which is about 100 times as big. Well, maybe 10 times as big. It's 120 kilobytes. So it's not big, OK? It's a tiny little toy model. But what I want to do. I'm going to show you some numerical solutions. But I really want to try to get you to understand, at least in this context, what's actually happening. Because it's very interesting what's going on. And this, even in this very simple model, it's already very interesting. I think it is. Okay. So to make progress in trying to understand it, I'm going to make some further approximations. These are not made in the numerical model, if you download it, I'm not making these approximations there. I'm going to make them for a kind of a semi-analytic treatment of the system in the next few pages. So I'm going to neglect the pressure dependence of the saturation entropy. It's not neglected in the model. You can actually turn a switch that says you want to include it or you don't want to include it. Okay. I'm going to say that in the inner core, where this is important, the uh, velocity is approximately equal to angular momentum divided by radius. That is, the Coriolis accelerations are not so important in the core of the hurricane, which is true of a developed storm. I'm going to neglect dissipative heating, and once again, in the numerical model that you download, that's not neglected. You can throw a switch and turn it on. I'm going to approximate the absolute value of the surface wind by the gradient wind. And I'm going to take the depth of the boundary layer to be a constant. That's also true, by the way, of the, of the numerical model. This is also made. In fact, these, both these last two things are made in the numerical model. So with those approximations, I have this system now. It's uh, thermal wind balance, the upper boundary condition, and the time-dependent lower boundary condition. I've replaced <coughs> SB by S star. I'm not worrying about the I for this development that I'm presenting here. You, know, I'm, uh, you have to worry about it in the numerical solution, but I just want to look at what's happening in the I wall region where it's convectively neutral. So we're gonna, this is going to be our stripped down uh, system. Now, what I'm going to do to demonstrate something about the way this system works, which is terribly important for you to understand about tropical cyclones. You know, and I don't think what I'm about to say is qualitatively dependent upon any of the approximations I've made. I'm trying to teach you something about this. So what we're going to do is to take this equation and differentiate it with respect to our independent variable angular momentum. So we'll just take the, all the terms in this equation and differentiate them with respect to angular momentum. Um, and then we're going to get h d by d tau of d s star d m. And I'm going to substitute from this equation for that. So I'm going to take d by d tau of d s star by d m and uh, substitute this for d s star d m. And now, don't be too frightened by the result. Okay? It looks a little ugly, and it's not an equation that you can solve because it's, not, it's open. It's not a closed equation. But I want to use it to make a point. So when you do that, and you multiply through by a few things, you get d by dt of v squared over this difference. And then I have these uh, numbers outside. And there are two, basically three terms on the right-hand side. There's one term that's proportional to the gradient of velocity with respect to angular momentum, 
And then there are these two terms. Now, let's first look at the particular place where the wind speed reaches a maximum in radius or in angular momentum. At that particular place, this term is zero because dv by dm is zero where v reaches a maximum. <coughs> At that particular place, the time rate of change of the velocity on that angular momentum surface is just proportional to the, these last two terms. But supposing that at least for a while, the velocity always reaches its maximum value on the same angular momentum surface. That turns out to be true by and large in the numerical simulation. So if it's true for at time t equals zero, this term will always be zero on that particular angular momentum surface. And then this becomes an equation for the maximum wind speed on that surface. Now we're going to suppose that there m is just equal to rv. And then if remember yesterday from the outflow condition, we derived that r max squared is equal to this. And if you make those substitutions, then you get a very simple equation that says that the time rate of change of the maximum wind speed is equal to a constant that's proportional to ck over 2h times the potential intensity squared, that's what v max means, minus the actual velocity squared. So this is just going to be a scalar here, potential intensity, if there's no pressure dependence of the um, ocean surface uh, saturation entropy. This is just a constant. And so we immediately see what the time scale is. The time scale is twice the boundary layer depth divided by CK. Okay, times the potential intensity. So the squares of the wind speed over here. So maybe I should write that explicitly here. That the time scale uh, is equal to, let's see, it's going to be 2h divided by ck times the potential intensity. All right? That's the fundamental tropical cyclone evolution time scale. Not, not genesis, right? We've already assumed that that's happened, but for the uh, change in the intensity of the storm. Now, if h is a few kilometers, ck is of order 10 to the minus third, it's a non-dimensional number, it's like, like, like the drag coefficient. Let's say this is 50 meters per second. We can do the math. This is going to work out to be around 15 hours. You just plug in those numbers. It's not short like convection, it's not one hour, and it's not long like Baraclinic instability is not three days, it's somewhere intermediate between that. Okay. And where does that come from? It comes from how long does it take to moisten up the boundary layer, fundamentally. Okay. That's where that time scale comes from. Okay, so that's one deduction we've been able to make from that set of equations. Oh, excuse me. Yes. So, yes. Uh, uh, just my comment. Okay. Uh, and uh, just let me go back to the real world. Okay. <laughs> Do we have so, to? <laughs> okay. Well, our equation our 16 is quite interesting. Yeah. The last year, you know, I co-authored the work of Professor Reyes, which shows that uh, most of the rapid intensification <coughs> event occurs just east of uh, Philippines. And it means, you know, that area, uh, maximum potential intensity is pretty high. But at the same time, the genesis location is very close. So the right hand side indicate you know weaker uh, vortex you know seed, yeah, which has a which is in a, a region with the high MPI, the rapid intensification is expected. So yeah, I, I'm very happy to see this equation. Good, good. So well, it may it may actually have some applicability to the real world. We made a lot of assumptions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know you are not in the real yeah. world now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, the real world's a pretty ugly place sometimes. Let's <laughs> try to stay in fantasy land. Um, this is just, oh, uh, I'm just putting this up here for review. We derived this ugly looking equation yesterday for the definition of potential intensity with all of this. is, again, for the special case that we're not, have, we don't have dissipated heating and we don't allow this saturation entropy 
to be of the ocean surface, there should be a star up here to be pressure dependent. Um, so if we go back to this equation, you can in integrate that analytically in time, okay? It's a nonlinear, one-dimensional ODE. You can have, you know, if you know how to solve those equations, it's very simple. We're going to solve it subject just for illustration, subject to the initial condition that the velocity is actually zero at the initial time. And if you do that, you find that the velocity goes like the hyperbolic tangent of time. Okay, that's the solution to that equation. And it looks like this. This is a scaled version of time. And, and this is the scaled version of the wind speed. And it just does that. It's a pretty simple curve. Right? Asymptotes to a constant of long time. Um, pretty boring. So, but that's one thing that comes out of this simplification. But the next thing is, if we go back to this, okay, and we say, well, what's happening outside the radius of maximum winds? We have this funny looking <coughs> term. Now let's look at that. This is m over v dv by dm. That's going to be positive inside the radius of maximum winds and negative outside of it. <coughs> All right. So we would expect the velocity maximum to move inward in angular momentum space if this guy in brackets is positive. But it doesn't have to be positive. It could be negative. All right. What's the condition for it to be positive? Well, if you look at this, um, if you say, when is this zero? This is zero when v squared is one third of what turns out to be like a nominal potential intensity. All right. So we could say that if v is greater than 1 over the square root of 3 times the potential intensity, then this term will be positive, and that will mean that um, you get spin up inside the radius of maximum winds. Okay, why am I, why do I think that's interesting? Let me try to show you why I think that's interesting. Let's ask, um, what's the actual vorticity in this solution, right? The vorticity, the vertical component of vorticity in regular physical space is the velocity, the azimuthal velocity divided by r plus dv by dr. That's the vertical component of vorticity. Well, let's transform that into angular momentum space. So to do that, uh, d by dr is just the m by dr, d by dm. And so um, plugging that in here, that's r the m by dr, if you use the definition of m, which I haven't written down again for a year, that works out to be r times f plus v over r plus dv dr. And that's just r times the absolute vorticity. So we have d by dr is r times the absolute vorticity d by dm. And if uh, we plug this into here, okay, zeta is v, v over r plus dv dr, which is r f plus zeta dv by dm. We can collect the terms. That's what I've written here. We can collect the terms in the vorticity and write that the vorticity is this. Now, why, what, why does that matter? What matters is that if dv by dm becomes as large as 1 over r, this goes to 0 and the vorticity goes to infinity. Now, some of you may have heard of the semi-geostrophic theory of frontogenesis. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever heard of that. It's a brilliant piece of work that dates back to Hoskins and Bretherton in the early 1970s, one of my favorite papers, by the way. And uh, it has the same property, that, that when you do the semi-geostrophic theory of frontogenesis, which is very similar to what I've written down here, but it's for a linear front, it, too, suffers that um, the vorticity goes to infinity in finite time. So what the equations predict is that dv by dm will increase inside the radius of maximum winds. And if it gets large enough, you can keep integrating the equations happily enough. It doesn't seem to care. But if you go to transform back into physical space, you can't do it. There's no unique solution. And so at some finite time, okay, a front forms. 
not after an infinite time, but after a set amount of time, a front forms. And that's the eye wall. The eye wall <coughs> wants to be discontinuous. It wants to be a spike in vorticity, okay, at some particular radius. The whole system, and this is so important for you to understand this, the whole system wants to develop a discontinuity, a jump in velocity at the eye wall. Now, in real hurricanes that have undergone rapid intensification, we actually see something approximating that. The eye wall can be almost a discontinuity. And some reconnaissance airplanes in the past have gotten into big, serious trouble because they flew through that discontinuity when they shouldn't have. And uh, this happened in Hurricane Hugo in the Atlantic in 1989. They very, very nearly lost a P-3 aircraft when that happened. In fact, the people who make the airplane, Lockheed, said that, and theoretically the airplane should have fallen apart. Well, the people inside the airplane emotionally fell apart. I can tell you that. I wasn't on the flight, but I knew most of the people on the plane. It was a terrible experience. Um, but nature does not like spikes in vorticity. And if you, this is a whole other interesting subfield of tropical cyclone dynamics I don't have time to go into today. But um, if you have a ring of very high vorticity, it's very unstable to three dimensional eddies. It's a kind of a barotropic instability. There's a beautiful body of research theoretical research, numerical research, and we see those in satellite pictures very clearly. We get a, a, a kind of a necklace of eddies around the eye wall, and those eddies flux angular velocity into the eye and spin it up, which is very important in the eye dynamics, and that prevents the discontinuity from actually forming. But the important thing for you to know is that the axisymmetric dynamics in physics, you want to form a, dis a circular discontinuity at the eye wall, okay? And three-dimensional instabilities, which are not part of this theory, okay, stop that happening in nature. You can still get very high vorticity in the eye wall, but eventually the eddies will transport a lot of that high vorticity into the eye, and that's what spins up the eye. In the numerical model that you can run, <laughs> I didn't need to advertise it quite so much. Um, in the numerical model you can run, you don't have a problem with that discontinuity because we're assuming basically infinitely efficient mixing into the eye that maintains solid body or nearly solid body rotation. You can actually choose what n is in this model, that is how concave you want that profile. So that's what I wanted to illustrate by that simple thing. So eye walls undergo frontal collapse. This is prevented by three-dimensional eddies. In the model that you can run, uh, the time-dependent model, you can run numerically. This is stopped from happening uh, or by uh, insisting that you always have something like solid body rotation. Actually, you don't have to have solid body rotation. You have R to the N. You can specify it everywhere inside. Um, let's just try to understand this physically, because I think it's important. So this is an old diagram, and I would have used different symbols if I made it today. But this is height, this is the center of the store, this is radius. And these are surfaces of both of constant angular momentum and constant entropy. So chi here uh, is entropy. Uh, sorry, it's just a different symbol. It's for entropy. So what's happening here is that Ekman balance, right, shows that uh, m dot is minus m times the velocity. Uh, it's, it's proportional to this. I've left out the drag coefficient. So you're going to have a maximum flow across angular momentum surfaces just outside the radius of maximum width. Um, uh, and right inside the maximum radi radius of maximum winds you're going to have a much smaller m dot, uh, much smaller inward velocity. So the Ekman flow is going to try to be pushing these entropy services closer together. So entropy is being invected. Of course, there's a source of entropy in the boundary layer, too. It's not quite this simple. But invection is trying to increase the entropy gradient.
but increasing the entropy gradient by thermal wind balance increases the surface wind. And if you increase the surface wind, you increase the drag, and so these radial velocities or sinks and sources of angular momentum get bigger, and so you accelerate this phytogenetical tendency. And that acceleration is so rapid that after a finite time, the surfaces actually come together, physically come together, which of course can't happen in the real world. But the physics is trying to, to make a discontinuity. All right, so if you run the model, um, this is the kind of result you can get. So this is taking the numerical solution, um, and so I can compare it to the very simple analytic approximation that I derived a few minutes ago. I've neglected dissipative heating and pressure dependence of the surface entry, but you can throw a switch and turn this back on if you like. And so this is the evolution of the maximum wind speed with time. And um, for three different values of the ratio of CK over CD. And so the blue curves are the integrating this time-dependent model, the one that you could download. And the red dashed lines are the solution to that simple, you know, the, the hyperbolic tangent solution of the approximate system. So it's not a terrible approximation. I'm actually surprised it works that well. You have to make a lot of approximations to get that analytic solution. And uh, what's even more interesting is if you, um, I said yesterday the, the steady state intensity in this body of theory only depends on the ratio of the exchange coefficients. But the time dependent solution also depends independently on CDK. And so we're going to look at that a little bit more quantitatively. Here are three solutions where all I've changed is CK. And you can see this is time, this is velocity, meters per second, this is days, that so we're actually back into dimensional space. And you can see that as you make CK larger, both the maximum intensity goes up, as we expect from steady state theory, and the rate of intensification goes up. Okay. The rate of intensification cares about CK. So I'm holding the drag coefficient constant. In this set of experiments, I'm holding CK constant. You can repeat these experiments if you want to, easily enough. And I'm varying the drag coefficient from small to large. So this is small drag, this is large drag. And just as the steady state theory predicts, the smaller the drag, the more intense the storm. That part that we expect. But look at this. Down in this region here, the rate of intensification doesn't care about the drag coefficient. It's basically independent of that. And there's a whole body of work. Uh, Mike Montgomery, for example, has done with numerical simulations of real, you know, complete models, but still in idealized environments, <clears throat> that show to a good approximation the rate at which hurricanes intensify don't care about the drag coefficient. Okay? The final intensity does. But the rate doesn't, and that's just what the sort of analytic approximation showed too. It's not quite, it didn't quite show that. Let's said that it's not quite true. Um, this guy, okay, it looks like, if you just look at this, it only depends on CK, this rate. But V max, which is defined up here, also depends on CD. So you really, without <coughs> integrating the system, can't, couldn't have made the remark, couldn't have foreseen that at least in the early stages of amplification before it starts to get up to maturity, to a good approximation, the rate doesn't depend on CD, it just uh, depends on CK. So, yeah. uh, excuse me. Yeah, so sure. why some deviation is occurs in well, so, so remember, these are the full numerical solutions. These are the analytic approximations. We had to make a lot of additional assumptions. So I'm not, I'm not at all surprised. Are you talking about up here? Right. I'm just not surprised the analytic solutions don't do very well, because they're dependent upon a lot of assumptions that aren't made in the new numerical what, what is it? Which, which approximation is not? Don't, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know which one. I, I suppose if I thought about it for a while, I could come up with some possibilities, but I don't know. And also, let me make sure in my understanding. Mm. Uh, for, I think 
this result represents the, for example, the Yuchin one says the linear uh, dependence of the you know entropy flux. Uh, meanwhile, the you know the friction has a dependence on the cube of wind speed. So yes. in, a, in a developing stage, you know, CK is more important than C D. Yeah. And uh, you know, in on a developing stage, you know, they should have a different uh, result in instead of uh, in, I'm sorry, A uh, in comparison with a steady state. That's right. And that's a very good comment. So uh, in the early stages, <coughs> because drag is quadratic in velocity, it's not so important. Uh, the heat flux is linear in velocity, so it's more important. But when it gets sufficiently nonlinear, the drag ca catches up. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. OK, just to finish this very quickly, that's just comparing the final profile of wind that you get in the solution. Remember, in essence, we've specified this part of the solution, the wind inside the radius of maximum winds for this model. But this is actually calculated. And then this is, uh, I guess the red is what we did in the time event. This is the um, analytic steady state solution that we derived yesterday, basically. So it's fairly close. And the last thing I want to do is we've done some testing of these ideas in a full physics, cloud permitting, non hydrostatic, but axisymmetric model. This is the Rotuno. And the model I wrote with Richard Tino in 1987. Happy to give that model to you if you want. Um, and so these are the um, simple model solutions and dash lines. These are the full model solutions, um, which have a lot of noise in them and so forth, for different combinations of drag coefficients and uh, enthalpy exchange coefficients. Here we varied the drag coefficient, and here we varied the enthalpy flux. So it's left and right are reversed from the previous figure. Sorry about that. And well, it's not quite true that the intensification rate doesn't really care about drag down here, but it's certainly more, it, it, it cares less about drag than it does about the heat exchange coefficient. So, in a very rough sense, the full model behaves similarly, but not exactly. Um, I encourage you to ask me questions about what you just heard and to try to run this model. It's, as I say, extremely simple. It's not demanding computationally. Um, and to try to use that to at least understand what's happening in this particular framework for understanding tropical cyclones. And remember, our framework is the atmosphere invection is really important in distributing um, static energy or enthalpy from the boundary layer into the free troposphere. And it does that quickly in this framework. And it holds the atmosphere always to be neutral. So the convection cannot be thought of as a causal agent in this framework. It's absolutely necessary. I like to say that you, you would say that the axle of your automobile, the axles, are absolutely necessary for your car to function. But you wouldn't say that the axle is what's causing the car to move. Most of us wouldn't say that. Okay, And, and it's the same framework. The, the, the rate limiting process is surface fluxes. Okay, and All the numerical simulations we've done with all models confirm that. It's not a convective time scale, it's the surface fluxes. Right? And um, in this model, that's really what's driving the system. All right? And the dynamics, the nonlinear dynamics, want to cause the eye wall to collapse to a front. It's horribly unstable at three dimensions. In three dimensions, it breaks down into eddies. The eddies flux angular momentum into the eye and cause it to start to spin. That causes the air in the eye to descend. And so the eye dynamics, what's driving the eye, can be said to be the tendency of the eye wall to want to collapse to a discontinuity. Uh, that's to a first approximation why hurricanes have eyes. So I think there's a lot to, I, I like, of course, I mean, I like this conceptual framework for understanding the basic dynamics. <coughs>
can you use this model to forecast? Absolutely not. It's not meant for that. All right? It's just strip down all the other things into an idealized framework. What's at heart? What's the, what are the basic dynamics of the system? Okay? And I'm a big advocate of, of doing that, even in, in, in an age where it's not so problematic to run very complicated models, because uh, complicated models are also very, very hard to understand, or hard to be used to attain an understanding, but they can be used to make, to test hypotheses. But where did the hypotheses come from? So with that, I'm going to switch gears and um, tackle the last subject of the three that I said I would tackle. And um, do this. Yes. Before, uh, before going to the start part, yeah. Okay. It's, it's now a good time to take a break. Uh, okay. Break. Yes, I think it is a good time. I think it's a good time. Uh, can I ask uh, one question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, could you show me the formula 16? Yes. Formula 16 indicate, uh, could you show me the formula well, 16? Uh, let's the, see if I can get it back. Uh, formula 16 indicates uh, TC with thinner PBL can easily get, uh, can easily get the maximum intensity. Maximum intensity? If a TC would say that TC with a thinner PBL. Thinner PBL. PBL can get the maximum easily uh, get easily. the maximum intensity because yeah. the PBL can be easily saturated. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Basically it's the time scale goes uh -huh. down or goes up with the depth of the thinner PBL down. because it can be easily saturated. That's okay. right. I'm sorry, I'm just having a bit of a problem with my having lost my cursor. So, yeah, we go back to this. Oh, we can go back. Uh, Six days in the Yes, oh. yeah, so that's right. So the thinner boundary layers. <laughs> but we don't really have a choice in the boundary layer depth that's sort of determined by the echo dynamics mm -hmm. here. So we haven't really considered those dynamics. We've just specified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. In this framework, you are assuming that the boundary layer entropy equals to green stratospheric uh, saturated entropy. Right? Out, outside the eye, yes. Outside the eye, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. it is based on the assumption that the convection uh, uh, neutralizes the atmosphere very quickly. Very fast. Yeah. So, well, the, how do you think that that assumption affects the early stage of the uh, evolution circle cyclone where convection actively develops? Yeah. Um, I don't know, except to say that observationally, the develop the genesis process is even slower than the intensification process. Right? It takes a long time to generate a tropical cyclone. More, more than 15 hours, usually. And so, in some sense, the convective neutrality approximation is uh, even better in those early stages than later. What's not true, of course, in the early stages is you can't assume the core is saturated with water. And there, down graphs transporting low entropy air into the boundary layer are incredibly important. Uh, by the way, I should mention that the model that you download from, from the web um, has a feature that I didn't discuss here, which is a very crude parameterization of what happens if you <coughs> put this vortex in an environment with wind shear. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is wind shear transports low entropy mm -hmm. into the core and then down grass transported into the boundary layer. And that shear, that parameterization, the simple model was developed out of parameterizations we've developed for actual forecast models. So it wasn't just blind shooting in the dark. Nevertheless, it's a parameterization. You can't it's not a three-dimensional model, but you can play around with that too. You'll discover if you put too much here and it won't it won't develop in the first place, it will just die. But if it's not too much here, it won't get to, to be the same amplitude. Anyway, sorry, I digressed. <laughs> yes. So about the time scale of intensification. Mm -hmm. So we have tried to answer the question about what governs the time scale of this intensification that we end up with this equation. 
Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit more details about the physical understanding of this equation or how I can explain this to my school kids? Yes. I think probably not to start with that equation, but to go back to this one here. This is just this is just the equation for conservation of entropy in the value layer. I've substituted S star for the boundary layer entropy because I assume they're equal outside the eye. That's the same thing. And so it says that the entropy is altered by advection, uh, but following a parcel in some sense, the main thing that's altering the entropy is the surface flux. So basically, how long does it take surface fluxes to bring the entropy of the boundary layer into equilibrium with that of the ocean surface? Okay, the answer to that question is the time scale over which tropical cyclones develop in this framework. Okay. Now, obviously, as the wind speed goes up, in some sense, the time scale goes down. Okay. But that's the fundamental time scale. You can think of that wind speed as being, you know, from a scaling point of view, the potential intensity, if you will, okay? And um, so you get this time scale. So as you mentioned in the past yesterday, mm -hmm. the heat flux from the ocean is the engine. It's the engine. Like that's why yeah. the time scale is governed how much energy the atmosphere can gain from the, from the, the ocean. Uh, I'm wondering uh, about the uh, equation seven. Yes. Uh, so, uh, can we use uh, this equation in the free atmosphere at the center, uh, near the center? Um, this is what we actually use in the model, in the free atmosphere near the center. And it's basically pretty simple. You're saying, I'm going to specify the, fun the dependence of wind on radius. Mm. How can I do that? Well, I can do it from observations, or I can do that from the knowledge that n cannot be less than 1 there. Okay? It's, you really can't have, you have to have a concave profile for turbulence to flux angular momentum into the eye. And once you have the wind, if you assume, which I think is a very good approximation, that you still have thermal wind balance, that is, gradient wind balance and hydrostatic balance in the eye is probably really good, actually. Then once I have the wind uh, as a function of height, of course, I can, can uh, determine the temperature distribution. So, so mm -hmm. uh, my question is, yeah. uh, dm is negative in facing to the center. Mm. dm becomes, is negative going into the center. But S star is positive. Mm, yes. It gets warmer in the center. Yes. So, but uh, yeah. I remember that yesterday you showed some figures of uh, radius height cross section of equivalent yeah. potential temperature. Yeah. At that time, I found uh, relatively low That's right. theta I, uh, air yeah. near the center. Yep. So, how can you. Ah, uh, because this isn't theta E. This is saturation theta E. It's a very different quantity. So that it makes all the difference in the world. S star is the saturation, if you can, or the saturation theta E, if you like. That's always a maximum on the axis. But the actual entropy, as you point out, can have a local minimum there. So this is a temperature variable. It doesn't tell us anything about water. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So regarding equation 16, so I'd like to know your opinion about how, how much the assumption maximum wind always occur on the same on the meter surface to be correct. Because I thought uh, the construction speed of R and W is much faster than that of angular momentum for the output of the cycling. That's right. So yes, and that's good. In fact, I don't particularly like that assumption. And uh, uh, Ito's son had asked before which approximation I think um, was breaking down in some of those comparisons. Maybe it was that one. Um, 
I don't think, you know, when you look at the full performance of the model where you don't make that assumption, you can calculate this. And what you see is that the maximum will be on a particular angular momentum surface for a while. And if you chose the initial condition just right, maybe forever. But if you didn't choose the initial condition just right, at some point it will jump to a different surface. And it will stay on that surface for a while. And then it will jump to another surface. Uh, after the break, I'm going to revert what you'll be happy to know, not derive a more complicated model, the Chipson model, which doesn't make a lot of assumptions like this. And it routinely jumps. And those jumps are essentially the model's secondary eye wall formation process. It's when the secondary eye wall takes over from the primary. So in angular momentum coordinates, that happens when the wind jumps to a new angular momentum surface. So the answer is in the simple model, if you choose the initial condition right, it can always be on that. If you choose it wrong, there might be one or two jumps. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, if, if not, let's take a 10 minute break or so. So please, use, let's use this block <laughs> until 10 20. Now 10, 9, or 10 foot. And let's start again at 10 20.